for the last talk of these uh, matinee, this, uh, this first part before the lunch, Jonathan Pico. Close yeah. enough. Oh, <laughs> the causal reality of entities, the gene knocking and knock out. Uh, so I don't see cases. So. And it's a, it's a common word with the Thank you so much. And yeah, I just wanted to start off by thanking Alexandra and Charles for um, organizing this workshop. Uh, this is co-authored work, and I should just say up front that Raylan did most of the work for this paper, and so I might need some help from him during Q&A. So um, he's a good co-author. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I just wanted to start with a brief introduction to the scientific realism debate. So um, this paper is supposed to be some kind of contribution to that debate. And one of the questions that philosophers ask in this debate is, can we demonstrate the reality of unobservable entities? And there are some paradigm cases of unobservable entities uh, philosophers love electrons, that's one of the standard cases, right? Uh, and also genes, and that's the case that we focus on uh, in this work. So basically, um, to a first approximation, you can say that scientific realists provide various arguments that we can demonstrate the reality of unobservable entities, uh, while scientific anti-realists provide various arguments that we cannot. So uh, what we want to focus on is what we call the causal reality of entities. And uh, there's two parts to this idea. The first part is that an entity that's taken as being a cause of some effect or phenomenon in some causal hypothesis or inference exists. Uh, and the second part of it is the causal relationship between the entity and the effect is real rather than a mere cognitive connection. So it's a kind of realism about an entity and about the causal relationship between that entity and something else. And so what we want to say is in some cases in science, uh, we can demonstrate the causal reality of entities in the sense of one and two. Uh, and the following methods can demonstrate the causal reality of genes in particular and the causal relationship between genes and phenotypic features. And we focus on three methods here, uh, transgenesis, gene knock-in, and gene knock-out. So a little bit more on these three methods. Uh, transgenesis uh, is, uh, involves introducing a gene to the genome of an organism that does not have that gene in a natural state, and then observe whether or not a new phenotype is expressed. Uh, gene knock-in is where you insert an exogenous gene, in general, a DNA sequence, uh, to a targeted locus of a genome in an organism, or substitute an original gene in the genetic locus with another new one, and then you observe <coughs> whether or not a new phenotype is expressed. Uh, and then gene knockout, uh, a targeted gene in an organism is deleted from or made inactive in the genome of the organism, and then you compare the phenotypic difference between the knockout organism and normal individuals. So I'll say more about all of these methods very soon. Um, we'll start with transgenesis. Uh, it requires this technique of recombining DNA so scientists use restriction enzymes to cut segments of DNA at the correct sites and then use DNA ligase to combine different segments of DNA. Uh, to introduce a foreign gene into a new genome, scientists use the technique of recombining DNA to link an exogenous DNA segment to a vector, where the vectors are typically viruses, uh, bacteriophages, or plasmids and then the vector transports the exogenous DNA segment to the target cell. And so an example of this, uh, you can cut DNA from plasmids and combine with DNA segments that encode various forms of antibiotic resistance uh, to produce E. coli cells with antibiotic resistance. 
Okay. And so uh, the argument that we want to give makes use of this concept that uh, Raylan developed uh, a number of years ago called experimental individuation. So basically experiments that create or produce individuals in some sense. Uh, and he has three conditions for what counts as experimental individuation. Uh, the first is separation. Scientists need to separate something from its surrounding environment or things that it's attached to in some way. And so in this case, uh, scientists cut or separate a specific DNA sequence from the genome of some organism, for example, E. coli. Uh, the second condition is manipulation, where scientists, after they separate something, they use it to do something else. So in this case, uh, scientists link that DNA sequence with the DNA in a vector, plasmids, and inject the vector into new cells. And then the third condition, uh, maintenance of structural unity or maintenance of structural integrity. Uh, this is, you know, maintaining the structure of the thing that you've separated and manipulated. And in this case, uh, scientists make some cells express a new feature, for example, antibiotic resistance, uh, that the specific DNA sequence is responsible for. So the fact that it expresses a new feature uh, indicates that its structural unit is maintained because the function is preserved, basically. Uh, so scientists thereby experimentally demonstrate that the transferred DNA sequence is an individual gene. Okay, so um, when Rayland originally proposed this idea, uh, he also suggested that when you experimentally individuate something, that provides the strongest evidence for the theoretical commitments that scientists have to particular individuals in the ontological structure of the world. So it has uh, um, epistemic significance because it's the strongest evidence that we have for uh, the existence of, of individuals. Um, in subsequent co-authored work, we developed the idea that experimental individuation is a criterion of reality. So if you can experimentally individuate something, that's a very good reason for being a realist about it. And then uh, the connection to the causal reality of genes here, uh, genes exist, and the causal relationship between genes and phenotypic features is real. Uh, the experimental demonstration of the individuality of a transgene and the demonstration of the specific causal relationship between the gene and the specific feature is something that's interdependent. Uh, experimental individuation gives you basically um, reason to think that genes exist and reason to think that the causal relationship between the gene and its associated phenotype is, is real. So in other words, uh, experimental individuation demonstrates the causal reality of genes. But um, there might be some reason for skepticism here. And you might think, OK, perhaps experimental individuation alone cannot demonstrate the causal reality of genes. Uh, you might think that we need uh, theoretical knowledge or theoretical assumptions about genetic mechanisms to demonstrate the causal reality of genes. Uh, for example, knowledge and assumptions about the encoding of DNA, uh, the transcription of genetic codes from DNA to RNA, uh, the translation of codes from RNA to synthesized proteins, and so on. And so, Basically, our goal is to try to develop an argument that minimally relies on theoretical knowledge and assumptions as, as much as possible. So uh, in order to eliminate or address this skepticism, um, in addition to experimental individuation, uh, we want to say something about causation, too. And our starting point uh, is Waters' concept of a cause as an actual difference maker and Woodward's manipulability theory of causation and causal explanation. So um, we have this ADM, which stands for actual difference maker. So Z, or, or X is the actual, no, sorry. X causes Z, or X is the actual cause of Z. 
if and only if x actually makes z happen and z is an actual difference. And then a criterion of actual difference making, uh, x is the actual cause of an actual difference, z and y, if i is intervened by manipulating x, and the actual difference z and y is made by this intervention. So um, when applied to the specific example of transgenesis, we get something like this, right? The transgene, for example, the gene for antibiotic resistance is the actual cause of the phenotypic feature, um, the antibiotic resistance, and Y is the thing that's intervened by manipulating X, the transgene, and then the difference Z, the antibiotic resistance, in the experimental organism is made by this intervention. So based on the satisfaction of CADM, uh, we can say the transgene X is the real cause of the antibiotic resistance Z, and we thereby warrant belief in the reality of transgenes and the reality of the causal relationship between a transgene and its specific feature without appealing to theoretical knowledge or assumptions. So I think the idea here is we don't necessarily need to say anything about this. We can talk about um, what happens when we do the intervention and what the outcome is. And Okay, so um, there is still some room for skepticism and um, it concerns the limitations of transgenesis as a method. So transgenes are not necessarily <coughs> incorporated into the genome of the organism. The combination of a transgene with the genome is random. Uh, and transgenesis can't ensure that a transgene is inserted at a proper site of the genome so that the gene can express its function. A uh, functional sequence of DNA can only be cut at the proper site by a proper restriction enzyme, but if you don't have that, you can't do it. Uh, and it's also difficult to manipulate or transfer any gene from a gene of interest from eukaryotic organisms, for example, mice, by means of transgenesis because they're more complicated. So uh, we have some more skepticism here. Basically, how do you know that the transgenes have been incorporated in the genome of, say, experimented mice? Because they're more complicated. Um, and this leads to the next two methods that I'm going to talk about. Uh, so there's gene targeting. And this uh, makes use of homologous recombination, which is the exchange of genetic information between homologous chromosomes, uh, and it has two major functions, generating variation in the process of reproduction, and also repairing defects in DNA. Uh, and then gene targeting makes use of this principle of uh, homologous recombination in the process of cell division to alter a targeted gene by inserting a marking sequence to a target locus of the targeted gene. And then we have these two methods, gene knockout, uh, and gene knock-in, and I'll start by saying a bit more about uh, gene knockout. So there's two stages to producing knockout mice, and the first stage <coughs> has four steps, which I'll talk about. Uh, first, you engineer copies of a gene in the test tube to produce targeting vectors uh, by inserting a neomycin resistance gene into the targeted gene, and then engineer the vector by attaching the herpes virus thymidine kinase gene at its one end, and pictures help. So uh, that's the NeoR, and this is the HSV-TK. So then you use uh, DNA calcium phosphate co-precipitate to introduce vectors into cells extracted from a mouse embryo. Uh, some vectors are inserted into the target site at the homologous chromosome by homologous recombination. Uh, the NeoR gene carried by the vector is successfully inserted into the target gene and inactivates it, which amounts to knocking it out. Uh, other vectors may be either randomly incorporated into some chromosomes so that the chromosomes contain the NeoR gene and the HSVTK gene, 
or not inserted into any chromosomes. So um, then you use two kinds of drugs to make a positive negative selection. So the first kind of drug basically kills anything that does not carry the NeoR gene, and the second kind of drug uh, kills the cells that contain the HSVTK gene. And then after you conduct the procedure, only the cells containing the NeoR gene inserted by homologous recombination uh, survive and proliferate. So this is basically what happens with uh, gene knockout, right? Exon 2 is knocked out and replaced by the, the NeoR gene. So the NeoR gene interrupts the targeted gene in the homologous chromosome and inactivates the gene. It also serves as a marker to indicate the cells that successfully recombine the sequences at the target locus. The HSVTK gene marks, serves as a marker to indicate the cells that randomly incorporate the vector. Okay, so we've been talking about cells. Um, how do you alter the genome of living mice? This is the next stage. Uh, you select a targeted gene in the genome of uh, embryonic cells, stem cells obtained from a mouse embryo and introduce an engineered vector into ES cells. Uh, you inject the ES cells containing the modified gene into embryos in the blastocyst stage, inject the embryos into surrogate mothers to re reproduce mice, and then crossmate the mice and uh, you get your knockout mice, and you can observe some of the features in the normal state disappear when the genes responsible for those features have been knocked out. So uh, the third method, gene knockout, uh, is where you introduce an exogenous gene to the target locus of the genome of some organism. The main difference between knockout and knock-in concerns the engineering of the vector that carries the targeting gene. Um, so you have complementary DNA, uh, an exogenous gene, for example, complementary DNA, uh, a marker used to indicate the complementary DNA, the PA sequence, and then the NeoR gene, which is again used to indicate that the vector is successfully inserted at the target locus. So again, in terms of pictures, Right, we have the complementary DNA, the PA sequence, the NeoR gene, and then the HSVTK uh, gene as before. And again, the HSVTK gene is used to indicate the cells that randomly incorporate the vector. So same as the knockout method. Okay, and how does uh, gene knock-in differ from transgenesis? Uh, with gene knock-in, an exogenous gene can be precisely inserted into a targeted locus uh, rather than a random locus as in transgenesis by employing the mechanism of homologous recombination. And unlike transgenesis, uh, with gene knock-in, <coughs> scientists can track the knocked-in gene in the experimenting process through an associated indicator. So uh, going back to the skeptical doubts about transgenesis, uh, you might ask, okay, how do you know or warn that the genomes of experimented mice have been adequately intervened? How do you know that the transferred genes have been incorporated in the genome of the cells of the experimented animals? Uh, and the method of knock-in can provide some answers to these skeptical doubts. So you can track the locus of the knocked-in gene by means of engineering the, of the vector used to introduce an exogenous gene. Uh, a gene like NeoR is used as a tracking marker to discern the, the ES cells that contain the knocked-in gene from those that don't. And the design of a trackable marker strengthens the warrant for belief in the causal reality of the knocked-in gene and the causal relationship between that gene and the phenotypic gene. So going back to uh, the knockout method, uh, we can also use some additional causal conditions uh, to support the argument. So we have a causation condition, uh, if X were not to occur, the Y would not occur. Regularity condition, Y regularly occurs when X occurs. And then putting these things together, we can say X is the cause of Y if basically both of those uh, conditions are satisfied.
And by breaking the structural integrity of a gene in the original genome, so as to make a mutation on the gene, uh, we satisfy this, right? When you knock the gene out, you can satisfy this condition. You can show what happens if uh, X were not to occur. Uh, and then we warrant the causal relationship between a knocked out gene and the feature in mice that the gene is responsible for by observing that the feature disappears in the knockout mice. And we can also apply uh, CADM to knocked out genes. Uh, so in this case, uh, the knocked out gene is the actual cause of the difference, the phenotypic feature that disappears when you knock it out. Uh, and then the experiment of mice plug in for Y. And based on the satisfaction of CADF, we can say that knocking out the gene X is the actual cause of the disappearance of the phenotypic feature. Okay, comparison with other views. Um, I should say the last like four slides are my contribution to this, basically. <laughs> So Raylan did like basically everything <laughs> up to this point, and um, I tried to situate this within the realism debate by kind of comparing with some other views. So uh, I'll compare it with uh, three sorts of views. So there's a uh, hacking's manipulation argument for the reality of entities, and then inference to the most probable cause, as uh, proposed by Cartwright and developed further by Clark. And then this idea of causal warrant from Suarez and Egg. Uh, so here's a quote from Hacking's book. Um, Experimental work provides the strongest evidence for scientific realism. This is not because we test hypotheses about entities. It's because entities that in principle cannot be observed are regularly manipulated to produce a new phenomena and to investigate other aspects of nature. They are tools, instruments not for thinking, but for doing. And so, I mean, there's a lot of this that, that we agree with, but I guess the, the point that we would uh, disagree about is whether manipulation on its own is enough. Uh, we think not. And I think there are plausible counterexamples to this. So. Um, Hassan Chang has talked about uh, experimental work in you know late 18th, early 19th century chemistry and physics, where it's arguable that you know you're manipulating caloric or manipulating phlogiston. So, um, in order to rule out those kinds of cases, uh, we'd like to add something more than manipulation. So. Um, Manipulation is one condition of experimental individuation, but if you add maintenance of structural unity and separation, um, I think you can get rid of these potential counterexamples. And then we've also added the causal criteria that we, we introduced earlier. Okay, uh, inference to the most probable cause is another sort of similar view. Basically, you infer the reality of a cause from its effect and a non-redundant causal explanation. So non-redundant means there's no alternative causal explanation that's incompatible with the proposed explanation and at least as good or better. Uh, and then the idea of causal warrant, the idea is that uh, inferences to the best explanation that satisfy certain criteria generate causal warrant uh, the explanation must be non-redundant, empirically adequate causal explanation, and the inference must be a material inference rather than a formal inference. So this has to do with uh, the properties that you would change when you're you know, doing things like interventions and, and stuff like that. There has to be a well-defined property and uh, a way to understand how it could change and so on. So I think the big difference between uh, these sorts of views and our view is that they ground the reality of entities in causal explanatory considerations. Um, and one of the reasons to avoid doing this sort of thing 
is it's not going to persuade anti-realists who are generally skeptical about appeals to causal explanatory relations or considerations to ground realism. Uh, our view grounds the causal reality of genes in experiments that satisfy certain conditions, for example, experimental individuation, causal criteria, like manipulation and intervention. Uh, another difference here, their views focus primarily on demonstrating the reality of entities, and we've tried to do something a bit more than that since we've also tried to demonstrate uh, the reality of causal connections and this idea that demonstrating the reality of entities and demonstrating the causal connections is something interdependent. Okay, thank you. Um, this is joint work, as you know. Um, if you have questions for us, please feel free to email us. If you have any questions about genetics, ask Raven. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Yes, thanks. I very much like um, the separation criterion. I think I think that's an important one. But I, I wonder if it's also not itself subject to doubt whether you have really separated an entity. I mean, take take the example of the prions, for example, which cause certain diseases such as Creutzfeldt Jakob or um, BSE. Um, I, if I have the history right, it was it was very difficult to prove that there was no nucleic acid. Um, responsible for the transmission of, of, of the disease. So how, how can you make sure that you have no uh, nucleic acid in your sample in an experiment that was designed to isolate or separate prions from, um, from nucleic acid? Yeah, good. Um, I will talk to Raylan about that case. <laughs> But yeah, that's uh, that's a good case to that for us to consider. Thanks a lot. Er Shirlina has already an answer. <laughs> I don't know if Raylan is actually familiar with this case. <coughs> yeah, he is. So. Uh, Do you have a question for Jonathan? Or? Oh yeah, shall I go ahead? Sure. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Really interesting. And I'm. Um, I know a few of us here have recently just read Chang's new book. And oh, cool. I'm, I'm going to be talking about it tomorrow, so this nice. details very beautifully. Um, and so I want to ask. Yeah, I want to first ask you to expand a bit on what separates your account. Uh, you mentioned the introduction of the separation criteria and how, and how this uh, distinguishes your account from somebody like Chang's realism for realistic people. But then I also want to, um, you know, just maybe just uh, countenance a, a, um, a response on his behalf and see what you think. Uh, namely, his, his uh, account allows us to do something like this. We can say, well, look, reality, realism actually comes in degrees. So something like phlogiston was for some time crucial to operationally coherent practices. So phlogiston is real. Now, oxygen is realer, right? It's more real because it's central to uh, more operationally coherent practices or whatever, it's, it's superseded. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so that's 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 just yeah. If you want to respond to that sort of line of argument from from Chang. Yeah, yeah, good. So um, maybe I should start off by saying like Hasok Chang is one of my favorite philosophers. <laughs> and, Absolutely. You know, we just read his new book last semester too. So um, I love this question. And yeah, as far as like what separates our account from his account. I think a lot of people, their reaction to his realism for realistic people is probably that it's not actually realism. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think I understand what he's 
try to do, and I think I understand why he wants it to call it realism, because he thinks that, you know, traditional kind of realism is just not going to work at all. So why not just take the name realism and apply it to something that is going to work, which is his proposal. And I think what we're trying to do, and I don't know if we're going to be successful or not, um, is try to get something more like the traditional realism than, you know, some, something that's not like the kind of pragmatist view that, that Chang offers. And I think Chang's response to us would probably be like, you guys are trying to do <laughs> something that's impossible. And our response, I guess, would be, we're going to keep trying. <laughs> <laughs> might say, right, is that um, you can't escape the the mind framing of the concepts that you're calling real. So, yeah. so genes are, are concepts that are framed by human experience and interaction with the world. Um, and so it's going to prevent you from, you, you can talk about you know how useful those concepts are in practice, but can you access the new enough with it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... I really like what he has to say about mind framing and I'm kind of sympathetic to the idea that like there's no escape from yeah. mind framing. Yeah. So yeah, I think Raylan and I need to talk more about this and figure out like what do we say against Chang and then yeah, this is directly relevant to like what some of the stuff I want to do within the realism debate coming up to. So I, I hope someday I will have a way to answer your questions. <laughs> I like the fact that philosopher of science was just reinventing Kant, Aristotle. <laughs> it's completely new. Well, he, uh, to be fair to him, he, uh, 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 but that's a general comment. <laughs> uh, he, he says that in the book. I, I became yeah. a metaphysician because I was unable to live with philosopher of science reinvented the wheel. <laughs> but okay, back to the prions. Back to the prions. We are ready to your answer, really. Yeah. Uh, Separation is one of the three conditions for reality. If you separate S prime is environment, then you might demonstrate its reality. However, if you cannot separate X prime is environment, then you can understand it is not real. Right, yeah. So, so is, it, is it some kind of an inductive argument or an I, IBE type argument that you infer, well, we've, we've, we've done so much to try to separate them, uh, there's no, no, uh, no uh, um, I mean, so you, you, you sort of induce on the failures to to separate them and you conclude therefore there is no uh, such uh, contamination or so I know what we want to say we want to say that it's not based on IBE okay and it's okay. not based it's not supposed to be based on induction either okay. it's supposed okay. to be based on experimental results but okay. then there's the question like how do you know from the results that you've actually done it or not and I guess one of the things that I was thinking too, um, I don't know if Raylan would agree with this or not, but maybe there's some interdependency like among the three conditions. So like, um, for example, separation and maintenance of structural unity, right? Mm -hmm. If you see like, um, for example, the same function being expressed or, you know, if, if there's some kind of other what do I want to say? If you have some evidence that like you haven't broken it, maybe that's also evidence that you've separated it from something else. Okay. But I need to think more about that okay. too. Daniel? Is there someone else? Was there someone that I missed? No. Daniel. So I guess I only have one trick today. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to go back to why we invite you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll go. I'll try to go back to Yudhishthira's distinction between methodology and methods here, which it seems to me that your your and Raylin's 
discussion of individuation is a methodological precept to say that in order to do my science, I need to individuate. And then the methods come, when, when they talk about methods, they're talking about how do we individuate? How do we establish the criteria by which we demonstrated individuation? Right? So it's, when you look at it that way, you've stepped back from the realism as such question which strikes me as being much harder to do just from going to talking about methods and methodology. Does that, I, I don't, this is not phrased as a question, but I just wanted to point out that there is a way of talking about the exact things that you've talked about absent, quite far away from the realism, anti-realism debate. And that there, I, I, I don't, there might need to be some more work here to say, to connect these two areas of the philosophy of science that I know very about. <laughs> yeah, so I guess is another way to put the point like, the idea of using experimental individuation as some kind of criterion for reality, like within the realism debate, there's kind of a <clears throat> some kind of gap there that needs to be bridged in some way. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I got it. Um, yeah. Good. So that's that's another thing that we'll have to think more about. Yeah. Thank you. You have one trick, and I have zero tricks. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I don't know if you, uh, someone in tai Taiwan reads French, but there's a nice book of a French philosopher that is exactly defending the reverse of your position. So <laughs> oh, really? It, it's, he, he builds a complete book ex explaining that experimental data have a, is, a, is just a higher source of authority. That's it. You don't think about real, not real, blah, blah, blah. It's a higher level of authority in scientific discussion. Oh, okay. This is the essence of reality, it's just authority. More authority there, less authority there. So, and it, it's applied to imagery and all kind of stuff. Uh, it's a nice book, but it's only in French. I don't know why. He did not publish it in English. Yeah, I get the reference. That, that's the later. enemy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> For you, that's the exact reverse. Wow, okay. We need it's to know nice about that guy. It was a postdoc here. Mm -hmm. Cool. I don't know if, yeah. Google Translate, maybe? Deep is really good, though. Deep is really good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Other questions, comments? Do we have, do we have time? To we have uh, a very short one. Well, I, I just wanted to say, I mean, I was really interested in this exchange, and I'm just wondering what happens if you just say in response, look, uh, the way to bridge those two fields is just that I'm radically empiricist about my metaphysics. Who, who, who is the radically empiricist? I don't know what that means. Okay, so, so, so the question is, how do we get from experimental individuation to the realism and to realism debate? Right? So what if the response then is just, well, What's real is what I. What's real is what I can do science with, right? Um, it, is that does that bridge the gap, or just there's something more needed? So, sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> For you, you you were the, you were the one objecting. Yeah. I, I uh, you have to convince me that the realism and anti-realism debate is worth having. Oh, there you go. <laughs> well, okay, yeah, yeah. No, I, I guess that too. Yeah. Okay, I'm not really well. I agree with you. But, but, okay, I, so, but I'm just one person. I know lots of people care. I think that you care. And I think there's just a, there's like a, a step or a step and a half to make. That's all. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So let's thank you, Jennifer. Thank you.